Hi there, my friend. Welcome to video number two of why mass shootings are similar to the Black Plague. And if you want to take a look at the first video, go ahead and uh, click the link above over here and it'll take you directly to there. Make sure you remember to subscribe to my channel so you see when I upload the third video, as well as uh, for any additional videos that I put up there, so don't forget that. Make sure to also hit the notification bell. And uh, do yourself a favor, go ahead and do me a favor, go ahead and hit this, uh, the like button, so just go ahead and bump up the YouTube algorithm for me. Uh, also, I ran into recently an awesome extension for YouTube creators called TubeBuddy. Go ahead and look below the link for that. It, it provides awesome tools for looking for the most suggested tags so that your video can start to stand up to or stand with your competitors as well as to help to optimize your video so that it can be up in the view of more people and possibly increase your subscriber base because more people are able to see your videos. It's truly fantastic, so don't miss out. Go ahead and take a look at the extension below at TubeBuddy. And beyond that, if you if you go ahead and uh, look below at my uh, podcast, my link below is for Anchor.com. And but you can access my podcast from any other of the major providers, whether you like to drive, run, or whatever you happen to enjoy doing while you're listening to a podcast. Go ahead and don't miss out and listen to this entire video series. It's all interconnected right there for you uh, at your uh, listening pleasure. So uh, enjoy and uh, God bless. Now, let us, you and me, ensure to understand what a gun really is. It is a tool, nothing more. It can be used for good or bad, depending on the intent of the user, other than to consider that the knowledge of how to create guns and use them, all of this knowledge is a gift from God, regardless of how people misuse that knowledge. Typically, these calls for increased gun control also tend to drive toward calls for better trained, more tactically trained police and military to be almost the sole users of guns, to be the saviors of society in terms of gun usage. There are also, in my opinion, incredibly unwise pronouncements by chiefs of police telling people to, uh, to rely on law enforcement to protect them. And even the Supreme Court, as well as another federal judge, utterly cast down that judgment as being completely nonsensical. It is not the role of law enforcement to protect constitutionally. Now, individual law enforcement officers might do so if they happen to be in the immediate vicinity and to be able to provide, prote to be able to provide protection to citizens, but it is not their constitutional role. Their constitutional role is to arrest and begin the process of prosecuting offenders of the law. Really, that's their core and pretty much only primary role. Everything else is tangential to that. For those of you who'd wish to know more about the role of government and economics from a biblical perspective, go and look below at the link for the Institute for Principal Studies. But let us look at the proposal of the police chiefs and really kind of peel that apart to take a look at the specifics on it. If you take some time to look at your own city and look at the ratios of law enforcement officers, police, as it relates to the rest of the population, citizens, residents of your city, it is typically grossly out of proportion. Only a few, ten, couple hundred, maybe even if you consider New York, a few thousand, to cover a population between thousands hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. It's just not logistically feasible for any law enforcement officer to be expected to be able to protect the entire civilian population. And if you consider that is the totality of the whole police force population at that time. We're not talking about the individual shift. Per, uh, per the shift work, even with officers being on shift for 12 hours, you're still taking that thousands, maybe tens of thousands, depending on New York or whatever, however many they have, 
and cut that in about half. It's also talking about 5,000 or so officers to cover a population of millions. Then factor in the location of these law enforcement officers in relation to any crime anywhere else in the city. Now that might be somewhat strategically positioned to be the most optimally able to approach the crime, but they still have to go through the process, you still have to go through the process of calling 911, depending on if they have a dispatcher to immediately pick up or one that will just force you to leave a message, which there are some municipalities who do that, depending on the budget that they have for their own uh, for their own uh, dispatch. Then you have to have it to where the dispatcher has to somehow calm you down because most people who are in the middle of being victims of a crime aren't dispassionate, calmly relating the details of the crime. They're freaking out. They're in a major panic mode. And the dispatcher has to take the time to do their best to calm down the victim while they relate in the details of the crime, like the address, what's happening, who's being attacked, but in what way, that kind of a thing. If it's a robbery, you, you get the point. So you're taking in the time to connect to the dispatcher, have the dispatcher calm you down, write down, take down all the necessary information, and then relay that information to the closest possible unit. Now, we're talking minutes here already. Three or four or five, maybe even ten minutes, depending on how long it takes for the dispatcher to get this information, plus the additional couple of minutes it takes for the dispatcher to put out the all points bulletin for any specific unit to be able to respond to the radio and saying, okay, unit so and so, I'm going to respond. And then you have to take into account the response time from, to get from where they are to where the crime is happening. So, 5, 10, 15 minutes, I actually have information I'm going to be including in as a link that goes into response times, uh, a study that was done on this. And considering this thing and the fact that there might be multiple crimes happening, you're also increasing the amount of response time it takes, especially if there's a lot more um, cultural upheaval for the police to have to deal with. It's just not again, logistically feasible to simply rely on law enforcement officer to be your protector. Now the information that I found pretty much lines up with exactly what I was talking about. There's also this general concerns related to common sense gun reform. But consider this, the first attempt at gun reform was the Brady Bill, which went into effect after President Reagan was, uh, there was an attempt on his life, a shot on the, a shot on the street, and uh, they put in effect the background checks and all, and all this kind of stuff, which also implemented the firearm registry, the federal one. And if you consider this federal firearms registry has helped to solve precisely zero crimes. Zero. But consider all that the registry can do. I mean, it's limitations. All the registry does is tell law enforcement who owns a gun how many guns they might have, what type. But it doesn't give them any information related to the crime that the gun is used in, only the person who owns it. So you have, if you consider it, you have your firearms registry and then you have the owner. That's in this group. But that doesn't mean that the person who fired the gun is the owner. Could be, but most people who are lawfully firing a weapon aren't going to go out of their way to go through the process all the red tape needed to purchase a weapon. So, consider that most all gun crime happens with a stolen firearm. I said most, not all. So you have this person right over here who's the perpetrator. Then they have their victims. So when you consider this, you have to find out, first of all, you have the victim. You pull the, uh, the bullet out of the victim. You run DNA tests, uh, you, rather you run ballistics to find out what gun it was used. Then you have to find the gun make sure they match, then you have to pull the DNA off the gun to find out who fired it. But that does not draw a causation or even a, even a remote correlation between the owner and the gun, not always. Could just be that a child stole their parents' weapons. It could be that you had a lawful gun owner. Most times it happens that a person has a stolen weapon and then they utilize that in a gun crime. Again, the firearm registry 
has no play in that, other than to say, well, this person owns the weapon. Well, what does that matter? Because it has nothing to do with the crime. The crime itself is utterly separate from who owns the weapon, typically. And even if you have it, all you have is a the person who owned the gun over here, maybe being the, the assailant, maybe being the perpetrator of the crime, but usually not. In which case, all you have is just an extra crime of receipt of a stolen merchandise. So, really the registry is ineffective there. It has nothing to do with the crime. Unfortunately, all the firearms registry and even the background checks really do is provide a cathartic level of therapy, just making people feel better that there's something happening. But there's a problem with this because you're creating all this additional red tape to make people feel better which is creating a major issue for lawful gun owners. If you consider all of the red tape that is being implemented with all of these gun reform, you are continuously increasing the delay in which a lawful gun owner can be able to purchase their weapon for, just to provide for their own defense, for the defense of their own family. When in reality, a person who's going to be committing a crime they're going to look at how much time it takes to uh, to purchase the weapon legally and say, well, screw that, there's no point. They might pursue it, but most of the time they're just going to go for a, uh, for a weapon and steal it from, uh, or just purchase it off the black market. Below is a link to the Tom Woods Liberty Classroom where you can learn more about free market economics, which is espoused by such amazing scholars as Milton Friedman and Murray Rothbard. Thank you for joining me. Make sure you remember to like the video, subscribe, and comment.